Oh, oh, what's happened? What's gone wrong? We've got a test pattern again. Oh no, YouTube's gonna ban us yet one more time. No, I'm kidding, oh. guys. Hello and welcome. Welcome, this is John and Greg, and we're here, and this is Oz by Drone. This is a very light version of what we normally have on the screen. Normally, we've got a whole heap of other things up there. My, my, my daughter and my wife, they've disappeared, and they've gone on a little bit of a trip. So because of that, I don't have my green screen. I don't have the camera that's normally used. Um, so all of that stuff, you can see down in the background over there somewhere, there's some green fabric on the ground. Um, so it's all just put away for now, and this is just raw. <laughs> this is Oz by Drone Raw. So hi, John. Lovely. How are you doing? I'm great, Greg. Great to be here again. Here we are up and running uh, with another show, and uh, we, we're, we're sticking with it, aren't we? I mean, we, you've got to really persevere with this thing, don't you? Yeah, look, um, uh, today, I, I'll just to share with everyone, so we were trying this restream thing, and we tried it during a promo thing a couple of, uh, yesterday. I gave it one more try today, and... It was all perfect during testing. I'm, I'm giving up on restreaming. It's, um, it's no good. YouTube, yeah, Raw, that's one. the way it'll be. Apologies again for the pretty boring background, but you know we'll get through it today. So let's get started. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Is the technology going to work? I'll do a little set, song and dance. Here we go. But yes, we're... <laughs> news time. So, look, news time. There's a, a lot of things happening in the drones scene. We don't have anything planned for this because I've been busy trying to get the tech working. So, look, there's been a lot of rumours about DJI, the Phantom 5. Is it coming or is it not coming? For example, I saw one video recently where there's a guy who actually said, here's the top five reasons why it's coming really soon and the top five reasons why it's not coming soon. What, what have you been hearing, John? Well, I'm, I think uh, it's good evidence that DJI have a product launch on the 23rd of April, uh, which is just around the corner. We have also detected an FCC uh, application, which has just been allocated for the Phantom 4 RTK. And the drawings that came through had a sticker on it where it goes on the aircraft and that's been talked about we've seen photos of it about six months ago uh it'll be an expensive commercial drone for aerial mapping but there's been so many of these aircraft used for mapping uh at the moment that the rtk is a logical choice to move towards and uh, I, I my guess is if we, if we don't see the rtk phantom 4 i don't believe a phantom 5 is at uh april 23rd we've got no evidence of that but uh the only other thing that that uh, DJI might have on the online is a upgrade to the, one of the Enterprise drones. We know the X2 thermal camera has been upgraded as well from some moose. So that's what we're looking at. Yeah, definitely looking forward to that. Um, it's always this, you know, when do you go and buy your next toy? And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to whatever that is. But we're going to talk about a new toy a little bit later. So our segments today, we're going to get into that in just a moment. And let's get started with the first one. So we got a special guest here today. Um, many years ago, I, I worked at Dick Smith Electronics, being the geek that I am, you know, you've got to work at an <laughs> electronics store. And uh, someone else worked at that same store with me. And, uh, you know, we can talk forever and a day about duck ponds, river sand and chook poo and fish tanks. And he'll be having a laugh in the background. He'll, he'll know what all that means, but... <laughs> I do. We're getting Strepto here, so hey, Mark, how you doing? Yeah, good. How's things? Hey, Strep. Hello from Bris Vegas. Yeah. So, so Mark is someone who does some serious flying with um, his equipment, and I thought I'd have him in here today. And um, you know, you went. Um, you, you've got an electronics background, certainly, right? So, with that yeah, kind of a bit. background, you had some fun recently with the. Um, with some drone parts and and, and and a leaf blower. Tell me tell me what happened and why it happened, and we'll have a look at the clip in a sec. Well, I just uh, spent a lot of time sweeping leaves out of my garage, which is where I do all my building, and um, I had a bunch of spare parts floating around. I've noticed just how much air these drones actually move when you're flying around, how much dirt and dust and leaves they can kick up. So I thought I'd use some spare parts and cobble myself together a leaf blower and make a, a little silly video about it. So um, 
that's what I did. I made an extremely dangerous uh, toy because it's got no no uh, safety features. Well, at least the first edition had no safety features at all. Now it's got a little switch on it, so if I let go of it, it will at least stop and it won't uh, tear itself to pieces flying around on the ground. But um, yeah, it's worked quite well. <laughs> okay, and, so uh, so let's, without further ado, have a look at the video. Let's yep. see. Let's see what you're up to. Sweeping, don't you? Hmm. <laughs> cool. These are all bits and pieces I had lying around. I bought the servo tester, used a few old, old broken bits of um, some of my racing drones and uh, a piece of wood. Now the troll face there is interesting. I forgot when I recorded this that there was a prototype that hadn't been released yet sitting on my bench, and uh, my friend you know, wrote, it's funny. So put the troll face on afterwards. <laughs> it's funny. I was looking at that and trying to work out what it was that you were um, showing off there or trying to hide. But yeah, <laughs> trying to hide. Yeah, as the uh, the Impulse RC Reverb, which hadn't been released yet at the time, and um, yeah, rather than reshoot the whole thing, I just put a troll face there. Yeah. Zoomed a couple of shots, zoomed it out. So very shortly we see you. Yep. Bring it to your test. Might be quite where there, mate. It's quite effective. Um, and also wonderfully dangerous. And I've, I've, uh, I've got an upgrade video now where I've, I've actually rewired a few things, put a different prop on it, which is made of durable plastic so it won't explode if I accidentally touch it against something. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, the switch that, that uh, uh, we'll switch it off if I let go, I thought prop. it was quite important to put a dead man switch on there. But um, yeah, bit of fun, still works, I've got it, got it here, oh, where is it, there we go. Yeah. I've got a nice six inch prop on there now and a high KV racing motor. An old fifty amp speed controller that I had lying around. This thing gets ridiculously hot as well. It's over propped and it's yeah, well over spec. It's gonna probably smoke the motor at some stage, but seeing as that's the only one I've got left out of a set of four, I've crashed two of the other ones and stuff, I figured I'd put it to good use. Yeah, yeah. no, it looks good. So, uh, you know, I, I look at this and I live in a townhouse complex and I'm thinking I've got to have me one of those. So I'll talk to you a little bit later after the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's simple. All you need is an old servo tester and um, a speedy and a motor. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Look, interesting, but without further ado, right? So that's the, the prelude. So uh, as, as well as building things, you actually do some flying. Tell me about the, the flying you do. <laughs> Rather a lot. Yeah, well, I've been flying these things for six years now, and um, uh, before you could buy a ready-to-fly thing, before Phantoms existed, um, GPS was still in its early days, and uh, and then I was part of the group up here. There are a couple of guys that made the first uh, the first commercially sort of available mini quads. Um, the Blackout was a famous one that a lot of people had back in the day, and um, here's from Brisbane. There's another guy called Scott um, Dreesens. He has a website called untestedprototype.com and he put up some plans for a mini uh, mini age quad and uh, then those got uh, downloaded and copied by the Chinese. They uh, adapted that and made the ZMR250 which is still a very popular entry level frame. So these two guys are basically responsible for a lot of the, the mini quads that, that have uh, since evolved and um, once we started flying small things, we realized how much more durable they were because they had much less mass. You can do more stupid things, you can take risks, so your flying changes. Um, and of course, racing grew out of that as well. So now we have a whole, uh, a new sort of almost e-sport of drone racing. Uh, as soon as you get people together with machines that can fly, they get competitive and want to see if you can go around the track faster. And uh, I've been sort of around that community the whole time. So I got friends who uh, started a company called Impulse RC. They make the top shelf um, racing frames 
export them all around the world. Um, yeah, I've been overseas four or five times and competed in a few races in the early days before everyone else got good at it and caught up and uh, learned how not to crash. My original strategy was uh, fly moderately fast and don't crash and you'll win. It worked quite well because everyone would go nuts and crash and, uh, and then I'd be in first place somehow but then they actually got good. So the young guys I can't put up with them at all now. So um, I'm having fun today without my normal producer who does all of this, so I've accidentally cut to the video that we're about that's to right. show, but that's <laughs> alright. So this is from Tasmania earlier this year, I went on a little road trip and a um, friend of mine, another mini quad guy that I was staying with, Ryan Rex, who took me out to this dam, um, and the whole idea is to fly FPV and dive the dam wall. and. Uh, that's what we did. It was extremely epic. It's probably one of the most amazing places that I've flown um, up there with mountains in Switzerland in terms of the scariness factor. So these early shots were done with a Mavic and I um, yeah, awesome. slapped the goggles on and we um, yeah, proceeded to dive it, flew two batteries and then we convinced me not to keep flying because we were ahead and we hadn't lost any gear. <laughs> no one stuffed up. Nobody. Um, pancaked it at the bottom of the dam. It would have been a long and annoying walk to go down there and pick stuff up. Yeah, no, I had to choose some, some dangerous, exciting music. The theme from the professionals seemed to suit this quite nicely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, here we go, down the dam wall. And then there's this beautiful gorge that you just dive straight out into afterwards as well. It's a really amazing bit of scenery. So, it just doesn't look real. So what was your first kind of quad flying that you did? Uh, first quad flying was just bumbling around the local park with a 450 sized thing from Hover Things in the States. And uh, I had some little model helis before that that I was playing with. But as soon as I um, discovered quads, I realized that's what I wanted. Because helis are temperamental and you crash them, they bend. and have a lot of trouble getting them to fly nicely, whereas, uh, you know, quads are much more stable. Even back in those days, this was my favourite dive, by the way. <laughs> Got nice and close on that one. It was actually quite hard to dive because it was concave, so actually, you can't quite see it, but it's actually like a, a bowl on the inside. Um, anyway, yeah, big quad, hovering around the park. I just like bumbling around and looking at things from up in the sky, which is a lot of what uh, your DJI flyers do these days, but once um, once we got these mini quads and we all got better at flying, when we first built the mini quads, none of us were good enough at flying to actually really exploit the potential of these machines. And it's taken quite a few years for the pilots to catch up with the technology, which is interesting because they're they're all manual. There's no altitude hold. There's no position hold. Um, they're just extremely highly strung racing machines, and uh, they do exactly what you tell them. And if you stuff up, it's all over in a second. But they're very yeah. tough, so you can you can ram them into things, and they generally just bounce. Yeah, look, yeah. it's um, it's definitely um, an awesome piece of footage. What what's the most unusual place you've flown? Um, in a supermarket. In a That's supermarket. Pretty unusual. Yeah, yep. Yeah. There's a video up on my channel called uh, "Let's Go Shopping." Um, I actually put an edit of that into the. Australian and New Zealand Drone Film Festival last year and it won the People's Choice Award, which I was pretty stoked with. Um, yeah, no, we got to fly in a supermarket after hours. Uh, it was all it was all sanctioned and legit and the manager said, go nuts, if you break stuff, doesn't matter. Um, and so we were flying up and down the aisles that hung chip packets from little bits of string and we were trying to hit those. Um, people were chasing, like physically chasing each other around with their drones in the supermarket. It was, it was mayhem. That's the sort of thing I love about this uh, this FPV hobby is that it's got this real uh, underground sort of flaunting the rules vibe about things because it was also pioneering, you know. And, um, so we love to find interesting places to fly and start looking at abandoned buildings quite differently. People have been diving skyscrapers, which is a bit controversial, or bridges or bits of infrastructure, um, you know, like the dam. And, so uh, just speaking of that, right, so the dam, yeah. you, you would have had um, yourself there. Um, mm -hmm. You would have had an observer there as well? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
yep, had uh, had my friend who was uh, spotting the whole time. Uh, we only flew one at a time, and uh, and he just had eyes on the situation. So he was telling me when people were wandering down to the damn wall, where people were, if there were any there. There weren't very many people there. It's, it's a bit of a remote spot, but uh, yeah, and you need that. You need that situational awareness. So if you're flying by yourself, you really need to make sure you're in a space where um, it's not going to get pedestrian traffic. You know, you're not going to suddenly be going around the corner and almost hitting a cyclist or something like that. So when we go out in uh, groups, it's always one person without the goggles at least and yeah. just have eyes on the situation. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I've known you long enough to know that you, you know, you're not going to be doing something stupid and unsafe. But technically speaking, correct me if I'm wrong, John, is that technically speaking? Uh, technically speaking, well, actually it is because um, if you check with the uh, the model aircraft laws these days, the MAAA now have a manual of standards for FPV flying. Does that and, only and apply? A, does that only apply on their airfields at their official events or anywhere? Yeah, look, at this stage, what what we like about mm -hmm. it is it's a CASA sanctioned way of operating, yeah. and they're operating insurance. So how that manifests its way and where you're going to look at the rules. What's exciting about it is that FPV. Is being is being done uh, in a sanctioned way, yeah. and whatever whatever uh, um, whoever's doing it doesn't matter. It means that we can move forward with it. Obviously, you know when you start doing this, I, I spotted for a FPV racer one time, and <laughs> it's actually quite hard to spot the airplane, and yeah. and really the person who uh, you know is flying the airplane. Um, it is so busy flying these things. I mean, you, it's a complete uh, absorption of, of what you're doing. Um, and the observer's got quite an important job. I don't think you'll ever ever be, in a, unless you're in a controlled environment um, where you're actually racing inside a controlled space, a spot is always going to be something you're going to want to have um, yeah. purely because it, mm -hmm. it looks after your gear. At least you know where the gear's gone. Uh, you know, someone's watched yeah. it. If it if, no, yeah, if you crash. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I don't know where, and, you, and, where you crashed. Yeah. And let me but say, they, that's a regular thing. And just on another technical thing, Mark, you know, mm. what, can you just tell me what the weight of, of that airplane is you're doing the dam diving? I'm interested in what, to, for that sort of agility, what, what weight is that airplane? Um, with the battery, it's around about the 500 gram mark. So okay. it depends on yep. the size of the battery, whether you're running a GoPro or not. If you put a GoPro on there, that adds a bit of weight. Um, we, we aim for a lot of our builds to be sub 500 gram because Brisbane City Council actually have a rule about things and uh, it only applies to things above 500 grams. So um, that's sort of always okay. been the target weight. Uh, there are smaller things now. A lot of people are flying micros, so two or three yep. inch, uh, four inch, and they're well under the 500. Uh, they can be under 250. And people are aiming to go under 100 grams because once you get under 100 grams, then CASA don't even care about you. You don't exist yes. as far as they're concerned. And that's but, what we're um, talking about in the next segment. That's all right. right, exactly. Yeah, we are. Micros. That's, that's yeah. coming up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm interested, I, I'm interested in one thing. You just mentioned that the Brisbane City Council is, um, you know, trying to regulate and preempt CASA in their ability to regulate the airspace. What, what, what are the actual laws up there? Oh, it's it's not that they're preempting CASA. All CASA's rules still apply once you're in the air. It's more about flying on on council land in council parks. So they're they're regulating that aspect of it, I suppose. So regulating um, the act of controlling as opposed to the act of the aircraft in the air. Yeah, because technically, once it's in the air, they have no jurisdiction. I mean, yeah. you can argue a lot That's of technical right. things. Uh, you can take off from next to a council park and, uh, and, then and fly, fly over. In it. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you know, there's a, yeah. and, and the same with the, the FPV rules and the spotter rules and there's the MAAA stuff and MAAA, um, like you're saying, have, have uh, the manual procedure which you can uh, fly at sanctioned events and we've had two national um, race events and there's club events every weekend pretty much around the, the country now. But yeah, just a dude flying in a park now, I think CASA still uh, want to classify you as being, you know, illegal unless you're... Um, actually at a model airfield so it, it's this gray area it's it's always going to be like that unfortunately they didn't really improve their rules when they rewrote them um last uh, year i think it was um oops. and they made a few things worse which annoyed people like um you know uh, sailplane pilots and things like that they they're not in touch with the community as much as we would like but we have been 
um, liaising and um, I've been involved with discussions with MAAA and with um, uh, CASA and with go uh, government, like local council, had a meeting with Ipswich City Council on last Monday. We're looking for a, a permanent home for having drone races there. Um, and they're really receptive to that stuff, which is, which is good. Um, it's only going to become more popular, so I guess they have to jump on this stuff and uh, make sure people are doing it safely. That's the they do. Thing. You know, Mark, one of, one of the things mm. that I get involved in is actually helping councils use uh, uh, you know, UAVs uh, for looking at infrastructure and so forth and doing surveys. Yep. And I've done, I've done nearly, uh, I think, six or seven of them now where we're travelling country councils. One of the things I always bring up with them is, uh, and they talk about recreational use, I say, why don't you be forward enough thinking to, to dedicate a park or get some land uh, mm. and put it, put it up for a drone park and mm. encourage the high school kids to go and fly there, um, bring it or the recreational users together. There's nothing like an aeroplane club. I mean, you know, those of you that are flying quads on your own, trust me, when you get together with, you know, six or ten people or even more, there's no, you can't have more fun. And, yeah, and it's yeah. the sharing, sharing of that that really a recreational thing makes it so much better. And having a sanctioned place where you can you can ensure uh, the the site, the council approves it. You can set up your own uh, uh, you know landing places and and fun uh, obstacle courses and all that kind of stuff can yeah. be done. You know, and and I think it would draw people to it. People would go yeah. there just for the social, like they do with model aircraft. No, I agree. And that, that's always been a big draw card for me. You know, I flew by myself for the best part of a year before I met anyone else who was flying because nobody else was flying. And then through the internet, we, we hooked up and there's a small group and we would just go out together and you, you're sharing knowledge, you're watching each other, you know, flights and um, skill sets growing and things. And, and actually, now that we've got actual events and, and race events and things like that, like the social aspect of those things, to me, is actually much more rewarding than the, the flying that you do in you know, the competitions, yeah. whatever. But you go for the fun and the shits and giggles on the side. And having these places, it's like um, skateboarding in the 80s. I, I'd liken it to that a lot because the, um, you know, skateboarding was super underground and whatever, and then the council started building skate parks. Now you've got skate parks everywhere. People can go and hang out and do what they do. I mean, people will still skate around urban environments, but it's uh, it's providing a place for for people to go and do that as well, which is important. Totally agree. It's only going to grow. So um, the community has been really good. The hobby community is really good at self-policing and self-regulating and educating. So um, I think actually a lot of the, the the more dangerous flying comes from the, the complete inexperienced phantom pilot who's just gone to the Ooh. Harvey Norman and bought one of those. Well, you know, we yeah. like to bash the TGI guys, but I mean, we all we were all noobs at one stage, and yeah. um, and and they're experiencing the joy of flying a thing, but they're not necessarily thinking through consequences and potentials and, and stuff like mm. that. So they they don't have that sort of mindset of, oh, mm. where is it safe to hover over? You know, yeah, traffic, yeah. no, not so much. So. Um, yeah, so that's that's part of the, the community side of things is, is that, that uh, sort of uh, educating so, new people, and it just happens organically, and it's it's generally done really nicely as well, which is, is it's a nice yeah. thing to see. In the community. Yeah, yeah, I had fun when I first started flying. I, I did the you know hundred dollar Kmart drone thing that my wife bought for yeah. me, and I had a lot of fun with that. And I think in a lot of ways it was good because it taught me to fly without the assistance of all of the other fancy stuff so that was good yeah mind yeah, you I I did, model <laughs> yeah mind you i did still lose it but that's another story that we won't go into today <laughs> um but what yeah, we will yeah. do so we're going to do something pretty um awesome we're going to get you mark to switch your video to something else oh yes i'll let you do go that. and um do one. that magic and um, yes. we'll sit here and tap dance for a while I've got a, a, a radio that's bigger than the Oops. actual uh, bottom. Yeah, look at that. Uh, oh, that's great. What's that radio? Uh, that's a Tyrannus. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, see. Special edition. And this is a DYS Elf, which is a, um, uh, a ready-to-fly little micro-quad you can get for a couple hundred bucks. And it's uh, FPV ready. Let's plug that in and I'll switch my... Over here, I've got a little uh, 
Uh, good luck. We should have a. Your um, internet is going great at the moment. There we go. Uh, there so we your, go. your audio is chopping. Yeah, your audio is chopping up a bit. But what we're looking at, so this is vision from Mark's quad, and um, he's got it linked up. He's in Brisbane. I'm in Sydney, and John is somewhere else. So great Hello. networking. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, that's cool. So I'm going to pop my goggles on. We're going to go for a little bit of a live fly. I'll probably oh, crash because yeah. I'm out of practice. I haven't actually flown for a while. I haven't flown this micro for a while. Yeah, let's, and, uh, let's crash next. Let's crash. Let's crash. Let's crash. Yeah, let's crash. I don't even know what channel it's on. Okay. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll arm. <laughs> Getting a lot of interference in my video. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. Well. I think I've got problems with. Uh, I think the drone itself's got an issue with the video transmitter. Consumo. There I am. Hello. Uh, like everything else, see. this was great when we tested it um, a little while yeah. back. Oh, that's awesome, man. I can dig it. I can see where you are. I'll try and... My garage is full of stuff at the moment because I'm in the process of moving, but... Well... Let's see if we can explore all my junk. So, yeah! So, I so these truly... micros will turn any, any small environment into your own personal race track. I don't know if I can hit this gap. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. There we go. And there's Dude, the bench. That, was, that was great. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's it's all cool. right. Yeah, no, yeah, that was good. Crashed. That was good. I, totally, I don't know what's totally. happening with the, those white lines. Are, they're not normally supposed to be there, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll flick over back to the other camera. Yeah, but these these things are, and they're they're brushless, but they they've got the the prop guards on them, so they're they're really safe. I can't remember what they weigh, but it's under a hundred. Yeah, that's pretty nice, man. That's an elf, huh? That's very cool. And Mark has frozen. I'm here. Am I frozen? No, he's totally frozen. So whatever is interfering with his his drone is also interfering with his Wi-Fi. Maybe they're on the same channel. <laughs> hey, Mark, maybe he crashed. He was just telling us how safe it was. <laughs> yeah. Okay, look, we'll say thank you to Mark and we'll we'll catch up with him another time unless he comes back in the next few seconds and I think he's definitely gone to meet his internet maker. Yeah. Uh, we've been having fun with the technology, even the stuff that's not in my place today. So let's move on. So the next thing we're going to do, and this is going to look really crap now because I moved the titles up before so that I could have the chat appear above us. See, all of this thing would look really, really good if I had my original virtual studio, but that's all right. It's okay. Let me see if I can do it anyway. And then our next topic will be... Well, we could, we could segue into the Tello. Yay. So, Here we John, go. So... Yes. So you've, you've recently um, picked up a Tello. So this has been, you know, obviously released by Rise and DJI for a little while now. Yes. Yes, it has. Yeah. Uh, it's a great little, great little quad. Uh, it's, it's, I've, uh, it's uh, new to me, of course, but what, I, what excites me about it, as uh, Mark mentioned earlier, it's under 100 grams. Um, with the pr prop guards on it, it's 89 grams. I believe it's 80 grams or 81 uh, you can see very, very small battery. Um, and what's really nice about it is beautifully made. Um, it looks like a baby spark um, in many ways. doesn't fold. 
and right down to the details, some of the really cool things, the, the wires that run out uh, actually to the motor are infused, if you like, inside the, uh, the plastic arms. Um, you, you see, although it's been built, built of a very light plastic, it's, it's a remarkable piece of engineering. And we think that, um, you know, discussing this with, uh, with other people uh, who are in the game, that uh, these quads will become very, very capable soon. So unlike Mark's uh, uh, racing little drone, which, you know, he flew, flies very, very well, um, there's, this has got a barometer in it, it's, and it's also vision positioning sensors in the bottom there. Two cameras that work in stereo. Uh, and, of course, in an adequate lighting, it'll take photos of, of the ground below it, provided there's enough uh, variation in it, enough light. And it's amazing how, just what a stable hover uh, it will hold. So we're sort of seeing, uh, you know, a backwards compatibility in terms of technology. A GPS in this would uh, would make it quite remarkable in terms of its position hold. But uh, thinking about it further, the reason that we don't have a GPS, it's not a great outdoor aircraft unless you're in virtually no wind. Uh, I've seen demonstrations of them flying in seven or eight knots of breeze with good pilot can fly them quite comfortably. But you are really manually flying it in that kind of wind. Um, and, you know, unless you know what you're doing, you'll lose it. Uh, it, it will take off and, and go its own way. Um, here's a little production video of that shows the aeroplane a little bit closer. Um, and uh, DJI mentioned here they power the aircraft. It's actually Rise uh, that developed the quad. Um, I've always felt that the Mavic uh, was a little bit like that, perhaps developed by someone else and, and bought by DJI. DJI, my little guess though there, because it's such a different um, platform uh, in, a, in a quad. So, uh, yeah, throw and go, you can see there, that's kind of nice. They are quite fun to fly indoors through obstacles. Um, FPV works beautifully. The, um, the vision is 5 megapixels in terms of the camera. Um, you can get all sorts of little other gadgets that, that hook onto it, um, but uh, it's basically uh, 13 minutes of flight time, raw like that. It'll, they'll do automatic little circles together. They'll spin and video on the spot, land in your hand, They'll do a flyaway um, uh, again. So there's a number of automated type, type uh, things that, that, that the, the little tello will do. Um, and they're kind of fun. I just be, you know, when you're inside and you're doing the fly around, you just want enough space. My guess is, um, you know, an indoor uh, basketball court, um, you know, they're really fun in that sort of thing. Because in fast mode, the little thing goes quite well, it goes quite fast. So, um, you know, that'll be a fun place to have it with markings on the ground and, you could certainly have some great races in it. $169 uh, from Kogan in Australia, delivered free shipping. Um, uh, give a little add to them because they've got a few bucks off. Uh, $189 seems to be the going rate in most online stores uh, to get the Tello. So there you have it. Great little gadget. Um, oh, again, my, you know, my always my newest aircraft is my favourite, and I've done about an hour and a half in this one. And uh, it, it's a lot of fun. I'll be keeping it. I'll be getting some more batteries for it. And uh, it'll, it'll stay in the briefcase. Uh, always to have a bit of fun. There's the tello. Yeah. Look, I'm looking forward to getting one myself. My wife has actually offered to buy me one. So I'm not going to say no to that. But no. um, yeah, look, I, I'm just loving the, the fact that it is under that magic number in terms of yes, height. It is. And, and that, that gives you a lot of flexibility. Well, more than flexibility, it's an interesting, uh, almost uh, interesting legal thing. Because here, see, there's no, when we talk about um, operating a safe way, the, the, an aircraft under 100 grams has no restriction, distance restriction for flying over people, for flying over crowds, for flying over anything. I mean, you can, if you went to a, and dare I say, I, I wouldn't do this, um, it's just not something that sounds right to me, but in a sense of legality, if you were at a, at a large stadium at a music uh, festival, um, you can fly it there. You know, at, at, you can fly it there. You basically, though, you could, you can see uh, that you could brush this off with your hands. It's not going to injure you. Uh, it really isn't, and it just doesn't have the mass, um, and it can't go fast enough. You could, you could basically bat it out of the air with your hand very, very easily. Um, no damage. So there is that. Um, there is that. But uh, my choice would be not to flight over people my my reason there is that i think that you know we're trying to build uh people's acceptance of these aircraft and and 
having something <laughs> that, that you're basically blatantly doing something different with, not illegal, but just flying over people. We're trying to encourage, uh, you know, that sort of practice. Uh, we're discouraging it, so I should say, so encouraging people to fly safely. Yeah, I'm just what? reading. I'm just reading some of the messages coming in here. So just just briefly, Mark, apologies that um, you know we reached the end of your segment. Anyway, we will have you back another time. So thanks for joining and having a look. That yeah, your radio probably smashed your Wi-Fi. Yep. I, uh, I so. see Rick, Rick's comment there. It works better with the controller. Is quite right. Um, now uh, I haven't tested the controller yet. I'm looking at because um, I'm using an iOS device. I'm looking at an Apple uh, de device. So what you do there is you, you take your phone, which has got, the, of course, the, uh, the screen and telemetry on it, and there's a, a game controller, a Bluetooth game controller that you can buy from most uh, electronic stores um, that are friendly to your device. Now, the Wi-Fi uh, on your phone is going to connect to the tello and the Bluetooth connect to the controller. And absolutely right, um, they are much better um, to fly um, so just um, in, just just briefly, um, Chuck Crunch, you've mentioned the comment you can never fly over people. Um, from a purely you don't want to hurt someone perspective, you you try and avoid doing stupid things. But the reason why this is interesting from a regulatory perspective, CASA regulates the use of these things, and the fact that if it's under a hundred grams, you can fly over anyone you like legally. Yeah, there's no thirty meter rule for under 100 grams. Um, basically, uh, and here's, a, here's another one you could respond to, Chuck. You could fly this thing down the runway at, at an airport. Um, not suggesting that yeah. anyone does that, but no, it's no, not... No, I fly over people. It's the same thing, but we're, we're really tossing around the idea here that CASA don't want to know about it. Mark's comment was right, and I've, I've challenged that, you know. Um, so, I, and there's no way you would do that. Um, it's just not something you do flying near, near anything near an airport, a kite or anything at all. It's mm. just something you don't do. And and so you'd, we'd certainly discourage that. What we're talking about, is, of course, is where the letter of the law is. Yeah. Look, I'm looking forward to getting mine, certainly. Um, the only reason it didn't um, get ordered already um, when we went on to the... Um, uh, online store. The controller that's available for it was out of stock, so <clears throat> we just put put a hold on that at the moment. But that that day will come again. The Mad Cat's iOS controller is that one uh, obviously that Rick is using. Yeah. Um, I looked at I looked at an Apple uh, Bluetooth controller purely because I just look you know can check up what are the compatible controllers. But I'd love to, I will uh, certainly investigate that one, Rick, because I'm. I'm looking for a controller for it. I've been enjoying flying the airplane, so I'll get a controller. Yeah, and we've got Daryl there. Daryl, you've got a question, and it's a it's an interesting one. Um, can you fly in a state or national park? Well, we're, we're in Australia, so we, we don't want to comment about laws in in the US. Um, but here's the, uh, the there's a the coming to the council rules again, Greg. Mm. If a, if a council says or a national park says you can't operate or take off. A drone from their land then the, it's an airspace issue and mark alluded to this as well if you're able to take off from outside um, the area um, and fly over then over the they, the national park doesn't control the airspace over the national park certainly not here in australia um, and so one well, long as you depart on crown land or land that you can take off from that's a different uh, ball of wax and of course there's no problem with um, with beyond visual line of sight, flying at night, uh, any time at all under 100 grams is unregulated under the standard operating conditions. They don't apply to it. Yeah. So just moving on. So it's that time of usually halfway through the show. I like to have something where where we can chat and have a discussion. Um, so we've had a few things coming up in the chat room. Um, hi, Daryl. I see you're in Australia. Welcome. Um, if any, if anyone here is watching for the first time, can I strongly ask you for a little bit of help? Because we are a new channel and we've had a little bit of fun. We've had some technology issues, as you've seen today, definitely. Um, <coughs> even during the course Bless of this, you. 
even during the course of this stream today, the the quality of this all of a sudden has just started getting better. And I can see the video is looking normal again. Earlier on, it was pretty awful. I don't know what happened, but um, I, I said during one other recent uh, chat, Thank you, Telstra, your, for your proud sponsorship. We do use Telstra Big Pond Cable here for the stream. And um, I, I'd, I'd love to get something better. I'm paying for as much as I can. Um, but that aside, we'd like to ask for your help. And let me just bring up a few things. So number one, um, like and subscribe to the channel. That'll help other people to see a little bit about who we are. Number two, if you're um, into Twitter, uh, we've got a Twitter account, and in fact, um, I'm intending to have tweets coming up um, during the show as well. I've set up a Facebook page, so we're going to post events there when we are streaming and when we're doing our stuff, so that should make life easy for you. A um, little bit more advertising as well. If you've got anything you want to send in to us to have a look at for any purpose whatsoever, um, there's a physical postal address, um, just in case that's of use. And we'll get out of that one. And lastly, just um, view a video. So if people want to have something that they want to share through this platform, through this show, um, send a link for your video to upload at gregkunit.com. Um, I'll have a look at that. Um, we'll um, have a chat to you. And you know we'd love to have you participate in the show as well. It's something a little bit different. We're doing this only because we like playing with drones and toys and computers and yeah, we'd love to have you come and join us as well. So without further ado, now that I've finished pressing all of those buttons, let's have a look at what is happening in the chat room. So I'll get John back on the screen. Here I go. Let's see. In Queensland, it's still OK for non-commercial. So I assume that relates to flying in national parks from Mark. Yeah, they go. And I suppose we need to qualify here for, for uh, what the weight of the aircraft is. If you jump into this conversation, um, you know, but this the, was the, this was the sub 100 in national parks following sub 100 that. sub 100. So. You know, most of the talk in the last 12 months has been sub two kilo, um, and we haven't had a lot of discussions about sub 100 until the airplanes are starting to come along now. And I think the reason that um, uh, you know the sub two kilo areas become so popular is that they're very capable quads. The Phantom Four Pro, 1.4 kilograms, are incredibly capable and use, and use so many on every day all over the place for commercial purposes. Are we going to see? sub 100 quads uh, used uh, commercially well I can tell you that if you if you were as a surveillance camera let's go cut right to the chase if you fly that somewhere and land it with uh, with the video open um, in for a, a surveillance purpose um, uh, it's a it's perfect capable it's not quiet I must admit that's not quiet but are we going to see that type of utilization um, for sub 100 aircraft where they're going to be developed purely for that kind of um, uh, um, commercial reason. I don't know. Um, it's going to be exciting to see them. Yeah. Um, just on the screen now, the message from Mark, feel free to sub my channel as well. So yeah, Mark, uh, I will put the link to your channel in the description. I deliberately didn't put it in there um, before the broadcast because once before we somehow got banned and I don't know if it was because I put too many links in the description. But after we're finished streaming, I'll put your channel description in there. And I would encourage anyone here to um, to go and have a look at Mark's channel as well. So without further ado, we're going to move on. We'll move on to our next topic now. And I'll press a button or two. And the topic will be... Very professional here. There we go. Look at that. You got, you got the flash screens coming up, even they haven't got your background. <laughs> yeah. Look, the st the stuff that you're seeing is slightly different to everyone else. Um, it's oh, okay. yeah. Ignore. Well, the my life is like that all the time. I'm always seeing things different to everyone else. Just ask my wife. Well, it's <laughs> it, it's it's the fact that you you're a drummer and you're pretending to be a musician. Sorry. <laughs> I know. That's right. Born, By the born, way, Mark is a musician as well. He's a muso as well. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, look, go, jumping into CivSec um, and the civil security, and I mean, I did talk about uh, 
this aircraft as a surveillance camera. Uh, on the uh, 2nd, 3rd and 4th of May, the CivSec conference and exposition is going to be held in Melbourne. And the third day this year of, of CivSec is sponsored by the AAUS, the Australian Association of Unmanned Systems, and they are going to have a full day on drones in civil security. Now, this, this conference has traditionally been uh, run and, and exposed by military hardware. They've, they sell a lot of stuff to urban tactical environment control and all sorts of things. So we see when we have a, 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 you know, a, a tragedy like Martin Place, um, where there were, there were you know, fatalities due to friendly fire, the, ur the modern urban tactical uh, equipment, if you like, and procedures are trying to take all of these things in where we engage the military in the urban environment. So there's some pretty interesting stuff. And, and I think there's a great application for, for uh, UAVs and UAS in terms of, of integrating with that kind of... So I've been asked to present there on the Thursday and I'll be talking um, about a couple of topics. Uh, firstly, in disaster management, so flying over um, the uh, Cyclone Debbie last year where we did some stuff there. Uh, also, the Chalora Waste Management Fire, we've, where we helped the, the fireys with their forensic investigation, flying inside uh, a still-burning building, um, which was a lot of fun. So that, those sort of things are very obvious. But uh, a new one we've been doing is working with a company called Merwin Partners on prison security. And, of course, uh, even here in Australia, but uh, in more cases overseas, uh, quads are being used to drop uh, contraband inside uh, prisons. Really? So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> thanks for that, Greg. I say it uh, tongue-in-cheek, but yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, well, you know, the, the, the price of a pouch of tobacco is about 600 Australian dollars. A mobile phone's anything between three and $4,000. Uh, you know, the, the, um, and I can might as say the cost of dropping it in there if you get caught is two years jail. So not only do you get to drop something in, you get to stay. Uh, you can have a two-year stay at Her Majesty's uh, for doing it. So that's uh, obviously any type of uh, illegal contraband brought into prison. So what they've been doing is been looking at, at uh, technologies that are available and cheap enough uh, to get started. Um, and uh, Maryland Partners have a system that they've installed. Um, it's based on the DJI Aeroscope system, which is fairly uh, straightforward hardware for looking at DJI aircraft. But also they develop procedures for the guards and so forth. So in terms of how that um, embedding those processes in prisons is and getting them used to looking at the aircraft, where they're coming from, identifying the owner, um, perhaps working out where they might have taken off from. Uh, yeah, that, uh, we're going to give a presentation on that. Of course, this applies once you've got any kind of sensitive site. Um, you know, these type of technology will be used in the future for detection. Um, uh, prisons, airports, uh, you're going to see it everywhere. And it's good. It's good for us because obviously people who... Uh, don't know where they're flying, they fly uh, accidentally somewhere, they're going to be picked up uh, and either, you know, educated properly or, or if they, they know where they are, they're going to be fined. Um, but um, I think it's time that, we, that, that those sort of things move forward. I think people will, you know, that most people want to comply. Um, and so uh, it's the so, ones that don't, you're going to get caught. So let's just talk about what, 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 what you have been doing and what you can summarise, right? So you've been doing work for civil companies, testing out drone detection equipment. Was, That's was, correct. Was there a number of different platforms that you looked at or was it focused on one? Um, well, my, my, our job was, they looked at everything. Our job was to, to test the system and, and try and sneak in, if you like. And so we had a number of ways, uh, uh, an aircraft that we tried, you know, some that couldn't be detected, some that could and all that sort of thing, just basically to prove the system. But can I say, when you look at the, the landscape of drone detection, there you can start right down at the beginning with the DJI Aeroscope, which is the cheapest platform available, only detects DJI aircraft. At the moment, 80% of, uh, you know, so you can bandy the figure around a little bit, but about 80% of aircraft that are being used for this kind of thing uh, and in the marketplace are DJI. So there you go. For, for the money that you spend on that one, you get 80%. Then it goes up from there. The other detection systems are radar-based, visual, acoustic. So you've got a listening device, that, a long listening device that can pick up the sonic uh, frequency of, of the aircraft approaching. All sorts of stuff going up to many millions of dollars if you want to. 
uh, and is being developed. And we're not talking about jamming devices here. Uh, we're purely talking about detection. And I, I think they are two different things. I think they're a different debate. If you put them together, you make the mistake of, of missing out on one where the, the problems with the other. And bringing down an aircraft in Australia at the moment is illegal. So you can't... That's you can't an interesting fire point. A la- yeah. You can't, yeah, you can't fire a laser at aircraft. You can't fire a radio beam at an aircraft to bring it down. You can't interfere with an aircraft in any way. It is quite a, a, a serious criminal federal offence to interfere with an aircraft. So, um, you know, that that put that aside to start with and leave the drone jamming stuff aside because detection is different. It's a surveillance thing. It needs um, uh, Australian uh, surveillance licensing laws to be done properly um, as well. So, you know, as I say, w- let's get the one one before the other because when they start bringing them down with jamming devices, then it will it'll complicate things quite heavily. So we'll see. Okay. Excuse me. <laughs> That's all right. So, so let's just do the stack right at the bottom. DJI detecting them detects eighty percent of the market. Then not the next a bad thing, gadget. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then beyond that, if you've got something different, you can detect the remaining twenty yeah, percent or part of it. Yeah, I think I think Department Thirteen um, are really investigating that great middle and advanced ground, if you like, at the moment. They've been doing it the longest. They, they, their technicians and engineers really understand the aircraft. So you might get a lot of electronics people that uh, know all sorts of things about radio and so forth. But my my sort of uh, money there is that I think Department 13 are the ones that have got their finger on the pulse because they've had they've got people that have been a long time in, in surveillance and security, and also they they've been on top of the technology in terms of the software that that run these aircraft. Um, so if you certainly check them out, you know, in, in terms of what they're developing in the, in the, uh, the bigger arena, arena, if you like. Yeah. Just looking at the screen here, we've got Daryl Leary, Lirad, not Rick Halliber. This software is doing, I, I, I throw up my hands in frustration with the technology, but Daryl, um, what did they use at the Commonwealth Games? Are, are you saying that they actually were bringing down drones or was it just drone detection and... no. That was drone detection, but here's the thing. The the Commonwealth Games, there, you had a, a friend or foe thing there, so uh, we looked at the contract for flying there because they, they've got a moat around a lot of the sites, the, what we call the 30-metre moat, that they could operate aircraft for providing surveillance. Now, um, I- interesting, that particular um, a newsworthy event, the drone wasn't brought down and the drone didn't infringe the TRA either that if you check the end of the thing although the drone did not actually enter the restricted airspace you know we found the pilot and cautioned him there was no further uh knowledge on that and we still don't know whether there was a there was a detection system used um i know the distributors of of certainly the the the, um, dji stuff they didn't have anything in place there so um so there you go they're using uh 2.4 and 5.8 jammers, I believe. So that, that's an interesting one because, uh, you know, I, when I went right through this with the Queensland government, they, they were very clear that you can't interfere with an aircraft. And the reason is you can't jam something and have it fall on someone. You're actually causing a dangerous event by bringing it down. Detecting doesn't do that. It might find the, You might find the person, but, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Mark, you know, we've got to have a look at just to see... Are they using jammers? Are they perhaps having a great big uh, gun-looking thing, uh, uh, Toys R Us, with a couple of electronic wires on it and some batteries um, to deter people? I don't know. I, I've got no idea. That would be my first choice if I wanted to keep uh, out. But you go and check it out. There's no way the Queensland government would interfere with an aircraft. They can't do it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. In- interesting. Yeah. So, look, long story short, Detection, 80% with Air Escape. If you want to go beyond 80, Mesmer or one of the other products. But at the moment, certainly in Australia, there is no, it, it's not lawful to bring an aircraft down. I no, think that's absolutely a, not. Yeah. yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. Okay. And just finally, you're going to be talking at CivSec. Do you want to say anything more about that before we move on? Oh, look, I, I'm going to cover all this stuff at CivSec. And I think 
um, you know, just as an operator, we can talk about, um, you know, the way, some of the, the technology that we're using um, and how more, my, I suppose my inter- the interest in my talk is about the future. How is it going to look in, in the world where we've got, um, you know, UAS, UAVs, drones flying all over the place doing things, delivering medical supplies, delivering prescriptions, visiting emergency sites, managing emergency sites, and the recreational environment as well. How is that going to look? In, in terms of airspace management, uh, what we call UTM, um, how Air Service is going to do it. And I'm going to just talk about the way Air Service Australia currently um, see the future in terms of three layers. They have what they call integrated ops, which are high-level military UAS operating in, uh, in uh, civil airspace. Uh, we have segregated, which is commercial operators like me that are operating in controlled airspace and around airports where we're managing the segregation. Uh, and then uh, we've got what they call shielded um, operations that they're going to approve. So operations below the obstacle limiting surface at airports and so forth and, uh, and sensitive sites, how that's going to work. But it, the future is going to be interesting. There's a huge market uh, in how uh, this is going to look in the future um, in terms of detection systems, in terms of how the airspace is managed. Um, and so, you know, I think CivSec is going to be a place where that's got, some of those cards are going to be dealt out and we're going to see who's got the strong hand. Yeah. Okay. Look, last comment before we move on. Um, interesting, I've seen reports of new towers with strange antennas on them stopping people from flying. Um, yeah. Well, that, that stopping people from flying is different to shooting them down, Mark. And, and there's, a, there's a point there as well. A jammer uh, that that absolutely and that, well you couldn't argue the no fly zone on the dji craft that won't let you start the aircraft uh in that you know a lot of commercial operators c- uh, complain that you know i'm not i'm right on the limit and it's i'm in the no fly zone it's not fair um all of the ems operators now have a a, a letter of agreement with dji and air services australia um and they've got a system for managing that with a tower so if there's a crash or and, and you remember the police and uh, the fire service and all these guys are having, and hazmat teams are having their own uh, quads now that they're using for, for their work. And so there's ways, again, the friend or foe, you know. Yeah, here's an interesting thing. Um, 5.8 digital video link cameras. Jamming just the vision, but not control. Yeah, that's an interesting one as well, because um, the, the, at the law, at the federal law at, at the moment, it says you cannot interfere with an aircraft. Now, you know, to me, the 5.8 jamming is interfering with the aircraft. You could argue that if the pilot's using FPV, then he's operating illegally anyway. Um, uh, you know, so it's easy for us to, ba- to debate it. But, you know, at the end of the day, if we debate what's, what's legal and what's not legal, we're going to end up back at the Constitution um, and federal law and saying you can't interfere with an aircraft. And at the moment... You know, firing anything, as I said, lasers, uh, is, is in federal law. It's a f- criminal federal offence to fire a laser at an aircraft or any other uh, electromagnetic energy of any kind that interferes with an aircraft. And at the moment, folks, um, our aircraft are aircraft. You call them drones, you call them UAS, quads, whatever you like, but they are aircraft in the, in the eyes of uh, our regulator, and yeah. rightly so. Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, just before we go, you just mentioned something interesting and I thought I'd relay an interesting anecdote. You and I were both in Canberra recently and we were watching some people fly an, a, a drone in, um, in another country. And when that was happening, um, there was someone shining a laser up at this aircraft. So There it, was. Yeah, yes, that's right. It was yeah, live yeah, it was. piloting of an aircraft in Mexico from Canberra via the internet. Yeah. And someone fired a laser up at the drone, so that was interesting. It happened live. It was just one of those things, and everybody went, whoa, there's a laser. Boy, yeah. There's a laser. You can see it quite clearly as it flashed up. But they were near a, interesting, they were, they were flying on a, at a beach area mm. uh, remotely. Uh, there was a person on the ground for a line of sight uh, with the aircraft. And uh, Mexico, obviously, a great place to do it, where there are different rules, of course. Um, and you could, they could do that. But it was a fun demonstration um, uh, as well. But the, the, there was an amusement park next door and probably sold lasers, for heaven's sake, you know, next, to, the, next to where they were flying. So who knows? Might have been, been a prize for the shooting gallery. 
Yeah. Okay, look, let's move on. We've got one more. <coughs> this is some fun. SMB. SMB. Yeah, serious men's business. Serious men's business. You know, when I first saw SMB, I always think of the small to medium business market. Um, yeah. In um, other cultural things, you know, secret women's business. Well, we've got serious men's business. And this is some footage that, um, John, you took a little while back. And yeah, it is. I absolutely loved it when I saw it for the first time. And uh, let's let's just share it. So the, the purpose here, and just a reminder, anyone who's got video, particularly if it's in Australia, um, send it to um, that, that email address and we'll, we'll share it in the future. I'll share that email address shortly, but let's watch the video. So um, turning fossil fuel into speed and noise. Now that is definitely serious men's business. Whose boats are these that you're actually... Uh, that's uh, that's my brother's boat, James. He um, he's got um, you know money for petrol. He burns it in all sorts of things. And the rule is that you can burn. Uh, you've got to burn as much fuel as possible in the shortest time. And you can either make you can turn it into speed or noise. So you can have go slowly, but you've got to make a lot of noise. And obviously, you can burn more fuel that way. Um, or going fast and burning a lot of fuel and making a lot of noise is really what the ultimate goal is about. So here we are in pit water. We're cruising up pit water. We pull into uh, the basin or coasters retreat, as it's often known as well. Um, the boat is a, uh, a, a day liner. It's a, um, a four winds actually. It's got twin um, V8s in it, and uh, it's a it's a rather a, what we call a sleeper. It's a very benign looking boat, but it really has some poke when you want to go in it. It's a it's a beautiful shape under the water. And you can see it's a, the underneath uh, the uh, water lines, much more like a speedboat hull. Um, but it's a, it's a very comfortable way to go fast, that's for sure. Yeah. This is, ages, this ago, is basin. ages ago, we went um, for, for a boat ride. It, what was that? That was like um, a, a jet engine as opposed to a, like a sea do ski do whatever? That yeah, it was, that's right. That, that was a sea do that we went in. That James had one of those for a while too. Um, th this is a props boat, but the Sea Dew uh, is fun because of its maneuverability and its shallow water um, potential. And uh, there, there we are pulling away from the basin. Beautiful spot there, folks. Um, it's on fire at the moment, but uh, it's normally quite, normally quite beautiful like yeah. that. So, yeah, yeah for anyone who's watching outside of um, Australia today, we're currently choking on some smoke in um, most parts yeah. of Sydney. It's very, very thick down here today. We've got very, very high wind. Mm. Um, yeah, we're going to call, call out probably uh, this week, Greg, so we've got everything on charge at the moment to get the team ready because uh, we'll be doing um, rapid impact assessment on the fires pretty much as soon as uh, the fires have cleared out. Yeah, even, even where I live, we had some roof tiles flying off one building and going over across to another and smashing gutters, so... There'll be some um, have quick little flights once it's safe to do so to have a look at what the damage is and what needs to be done. Hey, listen, I want to just say before you, uh, you know, we get towards the end, I want to say personally thanks to the guys that come into the chat room, um, obviously flyers and, and just giving this stuff because we love to hear, uh, you know, the things that you're hearing and, and what, you know, the challenge about the Commonwealth Games and jamming is very much our interest um, too. So anything you want us to check out, you can always find uh, us, uh, us here through the show um, and and send us a message, uh, you know, find a, find us through the links in there in the, on the Facebook or the Twitter site. And uh, I can always help you with regs. You know, if you're, ever, if you're ever worried or you have a question about regulation and say, well, what about this, what about that? Um, I've got a library of stuff here like you wouldn't believe and online and I can quickly reference what the law says when you really need to know. I, I, I'm not a lawyer, of course. I'm just a pilot, but I'm, I certainly, my job as uh, chief pilot of MAR is I have to know that. So uh, I can always look it up for you. Yeah. Speaking of which, I just put the promo up for the It's Time to Chat. I like to have a chat in the middle and at the end of the show. I've got one last message that came in before, which was jamming or interfering with RF as an offence under um, ACMA laws. Yep, absolutely. I would ask other yep, people... It is. 
I would ask other people to chat as well, except I've noticed that as soon as we put on the, um, the boating video, all of our viewers have dropped off. We've got no one left. Uh, we can have a joke about it. It's okay. We've gone over time. And John is frozen. No, he's there still. Oh, I'm, I'm still here. Sometimes on Sunday, I look frozen because I'm relaxed. I'm sitting in my... And, you know, I, I know Ken did that the other day. He, he pretended to freeze. I thought that was hilarious. He was yeah. good at it too. <laughs> yeah. Look, so we'll leave it for, there for today. It's been fun. We did have a lot of fun chatting with some of the people who jumped into the chat room today. We'll be back again next week, technology permitting. I definitely won't be doing restreaming again. Um, that was a bad experience. Um, I'll, it, it'll be a couple of weeks before we get my regular producer back, which is my daughter. So she normally does the controlling and I'm sitting in front of a camera, but she's traveling overseas at the moment. So until then, um, thanks for coming along, guys, and I'll see you next time. Yep. See you next time, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.